me in at number 5 we have Colossal Squid. The Colossal Squid, which is not seen by many humans unless they have washed up on shore, they are considered to be the largest and heaviest squid species in the sea, weighing a total of 1500 pounds and having a length of 33 feet long, as well as being the most elusive and mysterious creatures of the deep sea. The species were first discovered in 1925 when two colossal squid arms were found in a sperm whale's stomach. Then in 1981 another one was discovered and finally in 2003 the colossal squid was collected for further research of this new and crazy species of squid. But to this day very little is known about this deep sea creature. These squids are also known to have the largest eyes out of the entire animal kingdom, being larger than a human head. Unlike other squid species have hooks on their arms which are very muscular and strongly attached to their arms, and it's said these hook like things are used to help the squid hold and immobilize struggling prey. Sounds like a horror movie death to me. Due to them being so far down in the sea little is known about them and their behaviours but what is known is that they prey on sperm whales. Yes these creatures are fearless, they see a massive whale and say that's breakfast which is terrifying. Only a few have been caught and those couple that have been have been put on display at the Museum of New Zealand in December 2008. So if you're planning a trip to New Zealand I would definitely suggest going to see this massive specimen because the likelihood of you coming into contact with this squid while swimming is slim to none but then again why would you ever want to get close to this thing while going for a swim. Coming in at number 4 we have Atlantic Wolffish. The Atlantic Wolffish comes with a lot of nicknames, otherwise known as the Atlantic Catfish, Sea Cat, Wolf Eel, Ocean Catfish, Sea Wolf and the most fitting, the Devil Fish. Their blue like appearance makes them stand out from many of the other fish species in the deep sea. Besides their unique appearance, wolffish actually naturally produce antifreeze to keep their blood flowing due to their extremely cold environment. One good thing about these scary creatures is that they help control the crab and sea urchin populations which tend to get out of hand quickly and can have a negative effect on the health of a marine system. They have several fang like teeth in the front followed by three more rows of teeth inside their powerful and crushing jaws. Even their throats are armed with serrated teeth. If that's not terrifying enough they can grow as long as a fully grown human is tall so about 6 feet give or take. Their diets consist of large hermit crabs, starfish, crustaceans, large whelks and sea urchins. These hideous creatures are known for their quick strikes and even quicker kills because being a part of the deep sea community it's a fish eat fish world down there and thankfully we are safe from them up here on land. In fact the numbers of Atlantic wolffish in the US are actually depleting due to the overfishing and according to the National Marine Fisheries Service they are currently considered a species of concern. If you're an avid fisher in the Atlantic Atlantic Ocean tried to steer clear from these creatures and let them do their own thing. Coming in at number 3, Deep Sea Dragonfish. This is probably one of the ugliest fish I have ever seen which is why it fits perfectly on this list and that is the Deep Sea Dragonfish. Sometimes referred to as the scaleless dragonfish, this hideous creature looks like something straight out of a horror movie with its sharp transparent teeth, slimy skin and enormous mouth which can open more than 100 degrees. Even though it's not the biggest creature of the deep sea, that doesn't stop it from eating prey 50 times its size and that is beyond scary. This creature's teeth are stronger than the teeth of some of the fiercest fish predators like piranhas and even great white sharks. The dragonfish is a ferocious predator and can actually produce its own light through a chemical process known as bioluminescence but when he's not hunting prey he can easily disappear into the darkness of the deep sea and lurk in his habitat, 1600 feet under the surface of the ocean. The deep sea is the darkest and deepest corner of the ocean with crushing pressure and lack of oxygen and light it makes it extremely difficult for anything to survive down there. Thankfully this predator is deep 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 down in the ocean and hopefully none of us will ever come in contact with this hideous water monster. Coming in at number 2 we have Frilled Shark. The frilled shark is often called the living fossil due to its appearance, looking like a massive prehistoric eel. They have a dark brown exterior and are almost 7 feet long. These creatures are terrifying due to their 40 rows of curved razor sharp teeth which is a total of about 300 teeth. First discovered in 1876 by zoologist Ludwig Dodelin who classified this creature as a discrete species of shark and a few years later after much research it was later named its own species in the shark family. Given a name 
name because of its frilly looking gills and today there are two different types of species of the frilled shark. Regardless of how many species there are, I don't want to come in contact with any of them. This creature tends to live in the Atlantic and Pacific oceans and don't tend to come into contact with humans, but a handful of times they have been accidentally caught by commercial fishermen. Thankfully you probably will never come into contact with this terrifying creature because the closest they have come to the ocean surface is 390 feet deep, but typically they reside more than 3 times that depth. They live very close to the ocean floor and survive off of cephalopods, bony fish and smaller sharks. When hunting for food these creatures move similar to an eel, lunging and bending to capture their prey and continue to swallow them whole with their long and flexible jaws and of course their massive amounts of teeth. Due to the creatures living in the deep sea they are rarely seen and for good reasons, but there was rare footage that came out in 2007 of one, if you're not too scared you can go check it out after this video. And finally in at number 1 we have stonefish. They are known to live in the tropical pacific and indian oceans and these deep sea creatures have perfect camouflage to look like a rock on the floor of a coral reef. So even if you somehow were around one you probably wouldn't even notice it was a fish. They are close relatives to the scorpion fishes and consume other reef fishes and some seafloor invertebrates. They don't actively hunt their prey, they just wait for their prey to come to them, waiting hours at a time. And when their potential target is less than their body length away, they will strike. They have some of the most powerful jaws and very large mouths that create so much pressure they are able to easily trap their unsuspecting prey and swallow them whole. This creature is the most venomous fish in the world. It has 13 spines along its back that can release the venom, and this can kill a human within a few hours. They have a potent neurotoxin secreted from glands at the base of their needle like dorsal fin spines, which they stick up when disturbed or threatened. The more venom that is injected into, the worse it will be. Their stings cause terrible pain, swelling, necrosis, and then, of course, death. These horrifying creatures are actually considered a delicacy in many parts of Asia, such as Japan and China. They are usually cooked ginger and put into a clear soup, but could also be served raw as sashimi. As long as they're prepared correctly and their dorsal fins are removed, they are a dense and sweet snack and considered by many to be good for your health. If you're swimming in the ocean, you thankfully won't come in contact with this killer fish creature because they live on the ocean floor, so you won't have to worry. But if you're curious about the stonefish, you can check out more about it on the show River Monsters. They did an episode in 2017. Even though the stonefish isn't the largest creature in the deep sea, it's their venom that makes them the most terrifying. They don't use their venom to catch prey, but it's quite effective when they are threatened and can turn away even the strongest potential predators. Coming in at number 5 we have Titan Triggerfish. These fish are known to be quite aggressive to their prey, and they tend to bite divers who come too close to their nests. These fish are among the largest species of triggerfish, and they are commonly found in lagoons and at reefs deep in the ocean, stretching from Australia to Thailand. Their diet consists of sea urchins, crustaceans, tube worms, and coral. It often feeds by turning over rocks, stirring up sand, and biting off pieces of branching coral. They don't typically feed on other fish, but they've been observed being aggressive and attacking other fish who enter their territory. Along with being aggressive, naturally they get extremely aggressive during the reproduction season when the female is guarding its nest, which is placed in a flat and sandy area and looks roughly cone shaped. If you dive down and come in contact with the female fish near her nest, it will defend its eggs at all costs, often exposing its erect dorsal spine and swimming rapidly towards you to attack. It is suggested to swim horizontally away from the danger zone rather than going up to the surface right away. Triggerfish can grow up to 30 inches and their size and oval shape make them very recognizable along with their threatening looking teeth and have evolved as an apex predator within their natural habitat. If you're on vacation and are planning to go scuba diving or snorkeling, be careful not to swim near coral reefs because they tend to swim around there and if you get too close they will attack and bite you. The titan triggerfish bites are not venomous, they are extremely painful and can cause serious injury. Coming in at number 4 we have flower urchin. Yes it has a nice name, but it is anything but that. It is considered to be the most dangerous urchin in the world. This urchin has flower like patterning and are usually a pinkish white to yellowish white colouring with a central purple dot, and that's how it got its beautiful name. They tend to live in coral reefs, seagrass and sandy environments lower down towards the ocean floor and it feeds on algae. Bryozoans are organic detritus and can grow to a maximum diameter of 15 to 20 centimetres. They reside from Japan all the way to Australia and in the Red Sea to the East African coast. Flower urchins are among the numerous species of sea urchins known as collector urchins, and they often cover their upper body with debris from their surroundings to camouflage from others. They usually cover 
discovered in objects like dead coral fragments, shells, seaweeds and rocks. If you just simply touch this creature it can deliver excruciatingly painful stings that can result in hospitalization. It can cause paralysis of the tongue, lips, eyes and muscles, faintness, difficulty breathing and the inability to speak. A scientist named Sutomu Fujiwara who was once stung by the flower urchin described feeling like he was going to die. So when in the ocean beware of your surroundings and make sure not to touch this urchin. Another account of someone being stung by these dangerous creatures was the drowning of a pearl diver after being rendered unconscious from accidental contact with a flower urchin. Again if you are going to be swimming, snorkeling or deep sea diving in the ocean be very careful you don't come into contact with these beautiful yet dangerous creatures. Coming in at number 3 we have the blue ringed octopus. This creature is beautiful looking and easily recognisable due to their yellow skin and blue and black rings but it's one of the deadliest species of small octopus in the ocean and scientists have even classified them as one of the world's most dangerous animals. To the eye this creature is beautiful but their blue and black rings around their bodies change dramatically when they become threatened. Despite only being 5 to 8 inches in size their venom is extremely powerful and can be very dangerous to humans if they're provoked. If stung it can result in a number of things such as nausea, respiratory arrest, heart failure, blindness, total body paralysis and can lead to death within a few minutes if not treated or could cause drowning due to the results of the venom and the inability to swim to the surface. In order to come in contact with the creatures venom you would have to come into direct contact with the octopus. When faced with danger the octopus's first instinct is to flee but if the threat persists they will then go into a defensive stance and display its blue rings. If the octopus is cornered or touched the person would be in danger of being bitten and stung by its deadly venom. They are named one of the deadliest sea creatures for a reason because despite them being such a small animal they carry enough venom in their bodies to kill up to 26 humans with just a few minutes within just a few minutes. These terrifying sea creatures feed crabs, shrimp and other small animals. They reside in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian oceans from Japan to Australia and their species tend to only live around 2 to 3 years but this may vary based on their nutrition, temperature and intensity of light. Be extremely careful when in the ocean, be sure to watch out for these terrifying creatures. They would be easy to see due to their bright colours but if spotted swim away fast before you get attacked. Coming in at number 2 the box jellyfish. This is a species of jellyfish that usually tops the list of the most dangerous sea creatures in the world and the world's most venomous creature. At first look its appearance isn't too threatening but if stung it is life threatening. The sting can result in death in less than 5 minutes. The most recent death from a box jellyfish sting was in February 2021 to a man who passed away 10 days after being stung while swimming at Cape York Beach in Australia. Before that the last known fatality was in 2007 and total of 79 deaths since the first report in 18 1883, and that's just in Australia alone. In the Philippines, there are far more fatalities with up to 40 deaths annually. In Thailand, after a man died in 2014 from a box jellyfish sting, they enhanced their first aid stations on beaches. But yet, the next year, two more fatalities occurred due to this deadly sea creature. Unlike some jellyfish, the box jellyfish can swim, which means they're capable of hunting for prey and can move through the ocean at a very fast pace of up to 8 miles per hour. They actively hunt their prey, which tend to be smaller fish and invertebrates including prawns and bait fish. Unfortunately the box jellyfish has many enemies like crabs, different species of turtles, rabbit fish, bat fish and butterfish but their swift swimming and venomous stings help themselves stay alive. An interesting fact about box jellyfish is that in Hawaii the number of box jellyfish peak after a full moon which is apparently when they come near the shore to spawn. So if you're thinking of going for a swim in the ocean during a beautiful full moon I'd advise to just wait until the next day because you don't want to ruin a nice vacation with a fatal box jellyfish sting. No, no one wants to ruin a vacation by dying. That would suck. And finally, in at number one, we have cone snail. Just by looking at this little snail sitting in its shell, you wouldn't think it would be dangerous or harmful at all. Their shells are beautiful looking with colourful and complex patterns on its shell, but don't be fooled, you should never handle this snail. It is one of the most venomous sea snails in the ocean. There are over 600 species of these cone snails all around the world, and they are extremely toxic. The most dangerous species to humans are the slightly larger ones, but pretty much all cone snails are capable of stinging if handled handled or stepped on and can be very fatal to humans. Cone snails use a hypodermic needle like modified radula tooth and their toxic venom gland is used to attack and paralyze their prey instantly before eating them. The tooth is hollow and barbed and is attached to the tip of the radula inside the snails throat. When the snail detects an animal nearby 
that it wants to feed on, it sends a long flexible tube called a proboscis towards their prey and the radula tooth is loaded with their toxic venom from their venom bulb and is fired into the prey by a powerful muscular contraction. It's like gleeking. They tend to be found in all tropical and subtropical seas in deep areas near rocks and coral reefs. These toxic creatures are carnivorous and predatory and they feed on small bottom dwelling fish, marine worms and even other cone snails. If you're going to swim in the ocean you shouldn't really ever come in contact with these venomous creatures due to them living on the ocean floor. But if they ever wash up on the shore be careful if you're collecting shells from your vacation and make sure you don't pick up any cone shells just in case there's a snail living inside because it could be deadly. Only one drop of their venom can kill up to 20 people. So when swimming in the oceans, be careful and watch out for all these deadly creatures. This is why I never go in the ocean. Everything wants to kill you. Number five, the frilled shark. Chlamydoslacus ingenius and Chlamydoslacus africana, or better known as the frilled shark and the frilled South African shark, are the two extinct species of shark that swam our oceans. Thank gosh. Well, actually, still kind of do. Eh. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil. Not just its age and time spent surfing the coast, due to its primitive eel-like physical trait, the brown color, the jaws, eight foot body, and the way its fins, spine, and head move under the water are common in ancient serpents and water creatures. So this thing is like an eel-serpent-shark hybrid. Yeah, little jarring. Commonly referred to simply as the frilled shark because of its six pairs of gill slits at its throat. It swims amongst the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, usually in deep dark murky waters of the outer continental shelf and upper continental slope. These deep dive sharks usually live and sleep near the ocean floor. Okay, that's, that's a good sign of course. They live on a diet of cephalopods, smaller sharks and even swim to the surface at night to feed what's floating atop on the surface. When hunting, the frilled shark moves like an eel, bending and slithering to swallow prey with its long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 rows of recurved needle-like teeth. So am I just gonna like snorkel into one of these things any day now? Well, good thing is they're really hard to find. Like, really hard. Usually caught by accident in commercial fishing nets, usually at depths anywhere between 50 and 1,000 meters. So unless you're free diving at night, you should be okay. Yeah, they like it deep and dark. I'd say these things are already scarier than the Meg. It's like a shark but an eel snake hybrid with a shark head and shark size teeth. That sounds a bit scarier. Well, I mean the Meg preferred warmer, shallower water, so maybe this one's a tie. I don't know who's snorkeling two miles deep, but it's certainly not me, okay? In my opinion, I'd take a large great white over this dinosaur looking thing slithering after me any day. Number four, the fang tooth fish. Ah yes, the Anoplogaster cornuta, or commonly known as the fang tooth. I wonder why. Though they spend most of their time in the deep, deep, common fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. Sorry, the fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. That is the scariest sentence I've ever said. Dude, these are way scarier than this giant ancient shark. Like all the scariest things come out at night. You notice that? And root canals, but they're usually done during the day. The word megalodon is Greek words meaning giant tooth. I'd take big teeth over this thing chasing me around any day. Thankfully though, this guy is only about a foot in length. Okay, that's not so bad. The fish has a mouth that are full of long snake teeth, perfect for hanging onto its prey as they shake. The lockable jaws ensure that although thrashing may occur, the fang tooth's teeth are locked clamps that effortlessly swim with dinner in its mouth, just getting dragged deeper and deeper down, wiggling and can't move, trying to run for their lives. Well, swim for their lives. And fish of any size. I'm sorry? Yep any size. Common fang tooths have been recorded at depths of about 5,000 meters, so whatever lives down there, it's game on. Look at this thing. I was scared of sunfish and seaweed brushing up against my legs. This thing swimming by me? This thing? It looks like a night terror in itself, stalking their preferred prey of crustaceans and of course, other fishes the same size. Common fang tooths are more active than many other deep sea fish and seek out food for meal and sport rather than being purely ambush predators eating when they're hungry. That's terrifying. Packing up for the long winter, huh? Their huge mouth and very long teeth ensure that they are able to attack prey and actually hold on while they relocate them to a deeper, darker spot where they can kind of take their time on the meal. I've swam with sharks. In my opinion, this thing's way scarier. Like eating small critters running around the ocean floor, sure. But also imagine eating something the same size of itself with teeth, no problem. Slowly devouring it bite by bite. Yeah, that's way scarier, come on. Just reattaching itself every bite taking you along for the free ride. Yeah, that's, that's, that's horrifying. 
And number three, the big fin squid. Of the genus Magna Pinidae family, the big fin squid, or as I like to call it, this ocean alien with shoulders, belongs to a group of rarely seen cephalopods with a distinctive morphology, meaning they're really, really weird and rare. Magna Pinidae, meaning big fin, of course. The first record of us catching and looking at this family comes from a specimen talismani caught off the Azores in 1907. This was our first look at this bizarre fish, but due to the damaged nature of the find, little information could be extracted and was classified just as a squid. The problem is when you pull these things out of its atmosphere, it just looks like a piece of wet crinoline dress all of a sudden. Don't get the whole terrifying effect, you know? In 1956, a similar squid was caught in the South Atlantic, but during the 80s, two specimens were found in the Atlantic, then three more were found in the Pacific, and eventually the creatures found a place amongst the books as its own species, entering the family Magnapinidae. Squids. Okay, so it's not actually a squid, but loosely related. Like a third cousin of maybe alien origin. This thing looks like it crashed here on an asteroid. I'm just gonna say it, doesn't it? Like there's only 12 of these, not many. The arms and tentacles are the same length. The appendages are also huge and held perpendicular to the body, creating the appearance of a illusion of arms and elbows, giving its trademark alien figure. Most remarkable is the length of the elastic tentacles, which has been estimated around 20 to 30 times its mass and length. Deep sea video evidence puts the total length of the largest specimens at 10 meters long. Yeah, that's two trucks. Close-ups of the body and head show us that the fins are extremely large, being proportionately nearly as big as those of a big fin squid. Hence, the comparison. While they do appear similar, no specimens or samples of the adults have been taken out of the water yet, leaving their exact identity, bodily functions, and internal organs a mystery. Awesome. Yes, more mysteries under the water. All right, I only had uh, really bad night terrors already. Let's just add this in there. Yeah, I'd take a shark swimming with a brain at me rather than this alien thing swimming up to me and just staring at me, trying to understand me for about an hour. Terrifying. Number two, the gulper eel, Eurypharynx pelicanoides. The pelican eel, or what I just said, is basically a deep sea eel, like deep, deep sea. If you've seen the Ridley Scott's alien film franchise or the Predator universe, you'll know that this thing looks exactly like that. Yeah, am I wrong? But instead of like eight feet tall, it's only three feet tall. Yeah, still terrifying. The pelican eel has been described by many synonyms, yet nobody has been able to demonstrate that more than one species of pelican eel exists. Ride in solo, huh? That's creepy. One of a kind kind of deal. It's also commonly known as the gulper eel, or umbrella mouth gulper eel, due to its terrifying size and function of its mouth. The mouth and jaws resemble a pelican's gulp, hence the name. The morphology of the pelican eel can be difficult to describe because they're so fragile and oddly shaped that they become damaged when they're pulled out of the deep sea's immense pressure. We can't just swim all the way down there and take pictures, you know? The pelican eel's most notable feature, its mouth, which is much, much larger than its body, like five times the size. The mouth is loosely hinged and can be opened wide enough to swallow a fish three times its size. This thing has like a lower mandible of a python, just like unhinging it before dinner. The lower jaw is hinged at the base of the head with no body mass behind it, making the head look abysmally huge. It's basically a swimming mouth with a spine, tail, and I think a brain? Yeah, we don't really know yet. With dot-sized eyes, yeah. It usually is always moving too, rarely stationary. It hunts in some sort of folded state. The pelican the eel's mouth has the capability to change to an inflated shape when hunting, giving the mouth its notably massive appearance. Dude, the mouth unfolds like the James Webb telescope. Like a hundred working parts. Technically, it's like a geometric shape unfolding as a mouth, followed by stretching, like a cootie catcher. Remember those? This thing eats like a cootie catcher. When the pelican eel is in pursuit of its prey, it slowly starts unfolding itself. Imagine this thing's trucking behind you, unhinging its jaw, slowly the closer it gets. The head and jaw structure unfold and spread horizontally, not vertically. Okay, that's scarier all of a sudden. The unspreading event, or as I like to call it, lunch, is followed by the inflation of the mouth from a stretchable skin of the head, which it feeds on prey. Then, water's expelled via the gills. Okay, so it's basically a large strainer, and after it eats, it blows itself out, releases all the water back into the water. Just wrings itself out. Come on, this thing is horrifying. Thank gosh it only eats crustaceans and creepy little crawlies on the bottom seafloor. And number one, the phantom jellyfish. Stygio medusa gigantea. I love that word. Commonly known as the giant phantom jellyfish, is a part of the monotypic genus of deep sea jellyfish. 
Stigio Medusa. With only around 110 sightings in 110 years, it's a jellyfish that is rarely seen. Well, I guess like once a year. I don't know, I'm not really good at math. Believed to be widespread throughout the world, it thrives in all oceans and seas, with the exception of the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, a little too cold for it. The Monterey Bay Aquarium remotely operated underwater vehicles have only sighted the beast 27 times in 27 years. Dude, what's with all the matching numbers? Is this a CIA run? A study conducted by the Journal of the Marine Biological Association of the UK revealed info regarding the species and had this to say. The Gigantia is thought to be one of the largest invertebrate predators on this planet. Planet. One more time, please. The largest predator. It is commonly found in the ocean's midnight zone, reaching depths of about 7,000 meters. Deepest human free dive is about 300 meters. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're good. Unless you have a wide lung span. The largest predators in the deep sea, the giant phantom jellyfish's typical prey consists of plankton and small fish. The S. gigantia tends to be dominant in locations with a low productivity system, meaning it deters other predators of fish, like it likes it quiet. A shy eater, I'd say. However, when this thing is hungry, it battles squids, eels, and even whales. Okay, never mind. Just when I thought this thing was really cute, it fights off whales for food. The first specimen weighing in at 100 pounds was collected in 1899, but it wasn't recognized as its own species until 1959. Imagine this thing chasing you and catching you, tangling you in like 100 feet of netting tentacles so it can just eat you slowly. Does this thing have a consciousness? Like, you can kind of tell if a shark is swimming near or close to you or what it's kind of feeling. This thing just slowly, softly swimming towards you before it ingests you? Way scarier. Like, I'm convinced these landed here. The oceans are way scarier than things on land. We haven't even started to uncover the whole ecosystem yet. Coming in at number five, we have the striped surgeon fish. This fish is beautiful to look at, but beware to never cross paths with this creature. This species reaches about 38 centimeters in length and weighs only a little over a pound. Much of the body has black edged blue and yellow stripes, and the top of its head is striped with yellow. These fish have sharp forward pointing spikes on its spine and are extremely poor poisonous and are often referred to as knives. Along with the scary nicknames this creature has, it actually gets its name Surgeon because of its sharp angular scalpel like tail and is sharp enough to easily cut you. These fish are very territorial with a large male defending a feeding territory and a haram of females. The adults may also school and they gather during spawning. The fish eats mostly crustaceans and algae. It's so aggressive that it might try and corner or bully members of its own species to get the best resources. Not only are they aggressive with their own species, but they display the same behavior to fish outside of their species. The surgeon fish is a fast swimmer that can swim up to 25 miles per hour and can live up to a whopping 20 years. These scary creatures dwell in the shallow parts of the ocean where the reef crests are located and often found in tropical oceans like the Indo-Pacific Ocean and Northern Great Barrier Reef. So if you're going to be swimming in the tropical oceans on vacation, be very careful of this creature. Don't be fooled by its beauty and stay far away because it will defend itself and its spawn at all costs and can infect you with its venom. Scientists believe that the world's seas hold around 1200 of these different venomous fish species and that they injure an estimated 50,000 people per year so beware and stay away from the striped surgeon fish. In at number 4 we have sea slugs. These are again a beautiful creature to look at but you will need to stay far away from them. Sea slugs have an enormous variation variation in body shape, color, and size. Most of them tend to be partially translucent, and their often bright colors imply that these animals are under constant threat of predators. But the color can serve as a warning to other animals of the sea slug's toxic stinging cells or offensive taste. Some sea slugs eat prey that contains poison or venom, and instead of killing the prey, these slugs store the poison and release at predators for its own protection. Another disturbing fact about the sea slug is that they are cannibals. They are known to eat each other. They may eat a dead sea slug or attack a live one to eat it. Not only do they feed off their own, these creatures also eat plankton, algae, and jellyfish. These animals also have both male and female sex organs, and they can lay mass amounts of eggs, sometimes up to one million eggs, and these deadly creatures can live up to four years. Sea hares, which is a common name for a large group of herbivores, sea slugs, and the largest of the sea hares, is the California black sea hare, which are naturally toxic, and they can eject a foul ink or secrete a vicious slime to deter predators. One type of sea slug in particular, the grey-side guild sea slug, has been 
even linked to canine deaths and beachgoers are warned to keep their children and pets close by to avoid accidental ingestion or contact. There are so many types of sea slugs and most of them are extremely dangerous so if you see a pretty looking glob near the shore or while swimming, avoid it at all costs. In at number 3 we have the pufferfish. There are more than 120 different species of pufferfish worldwide and are mostly found in tropical and subtropical ocean waters. They can range in size from 1 inch long dwarf puffer to the freshwater giant puffer which can grow to more than 2 feet in length. These creatures are scaleless fish and usually have rough to spiky skin. All have 4 teeth that are fused together in a beak like form. Pufferfish tend to mostly feed on invertebrates and algae while larger puffers will even crack open and eat clams, mussels and shellfish with their hard beaks. Poisonous puffers are believed to synthesize their deadly toxin from the bacteria in the animals they eat. Due to their slow and clumsy swimming style makes puffers very vulnerable to predators. When they feel threatened or notice a predator they will use their highly elastic stomachs and the ability to quickly ingest huge amounts of water to turn themselves into a virtually inedible ball several times their normal size. Almost all pufferfish contain tetrodotoxin, a substance that makes them foul tasting and often lethal to fish. To humans these creatures are extremely toxic and deadly, they are up to 1200 times more poisonous than cyanide. There is enough toxin in one pufferfish to kill 20 adult humans and there is no known antidote. This toxin is secreted across their body making puffers dangerous to touch and even more dangerous to consume. Surprisingly the meat of some pufferfish is considered a delicacy called fuju in Japan. It is extremely expensive and can only be prepared by trained licensed chefs who know how to prepare it properly because one bad cut means almost certain death for a customer. Many such chefs occur annually because of poor preparation. In at number 2 we have Kandiru. This fish is something out of a nightmare. This creature has many scary nicknames such as the toothpick fish or vampire fish. These fish tend to be small only growing to about 7 inches but others can grow larger around 16 inches. Their heads are small with short sensory barbels around it, backward pointing spines on the gill covers and their bodies are translucent and make it difficult to spot these creatures. They tend to reside in the Amazon so if you're planning a trip beware of these creepy creatures if you're going for a quick dip. Not many humans have been attacked which is good but those that have it's been deadly. This scary creature feeds on blood and has been found feeding on the urethras of swimmers. Once it penetrates its victims it can cause inflammation, hemorrhaging and even death. The earliest report of the Kandiru attacking a human was in 1829 then again in 1855 and local Aragui fishermen stated that it is dangerous to urinate in the water as the fish springs out of the water and penetrates into the urethra by ascending the length of the liquid column. The most recent attack of a Kandiru to a human was in 1997 in Brazil. 23 year old man was urinating while thigh deep in the water when he claimed the creature jumped from the water into his urethra. The victim underwent a two hour surgery to remove the fish from its body. Many speculate that these fish are attracted by the odour of the urine in the water and that's what makes them attack but others think these creatures hunt by sight and have no attraction to the urine at all. I think this creature might be the most terrifying of all sea creatures because instead of just stinging or biting you this creature actually inserts himself inside the human body and wreaks havoc. And finally in number 1 we have Du Bois sea snake slash beaked sea snake. There are more than 50 species of sea snakes but the deadliest are the Du Bois sea snake and the beaked sea snake. These venomous snakes reside in many regions of Australia, Papua New Guinea, New Caledonia and are common throughout the Indo-Pacific. They live in coral reef flats, sandy and silty sediments which contain seaweed, invertebrates and coral or sponges that can serve as shelter to them. These snakes feed on moray eels and various fish that live on the sea floor up to 3.5 feet in size. Their venom affects its prey's ability to contract the muscles and makes the prey flaccid to make it easier for the snakes to eat. The Du Bois sea snake is the most venomous sea snakes and one of the top three in the world. These snakes use their fangs to bite and release their venom to immobilize their prey for their own protection. The toxins in these snakes venom affects the nervous system and it causes paralyzation of the body's muscles, then causes death due to respiratory failure. The beaked sea snake is responsible for more than 50% of all sea snake bites and each 
each bite contains anywhere from 7.9 to 9 milligrams of venom. A human can die from just 1.5 milligrams. Scientists have estimated that their venom is four to eight times more lethal than that of a cobra. So along with the Du Bois snake, this venomous creature is among the most dangerous and venomous snake in the world. Not only do you have to be worried about venomous snakes on land, but some of the deadliest are in our oceans. So be careful when swimming in warm climates, and be sure to not come in contact with these scary creatures. Number five, the Lurleen Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10 story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10 story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra will regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, there's two more. Another two are growing. Yeah, good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, aka Huge Monster, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the world serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, Roid Rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay per view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called the Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, 
ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus dragon humanoid bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah. Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg, for sure. And also, the mind control, I don't know how Shark's brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there. Yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred text now, the Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities, apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster, the Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? Like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This Leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Cause apparently it's something like 300 miles long according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature told by two different peoples? Oh, <gasps> mind blown. Again, the Megalodon I think would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the twilight zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the king of kings, aka Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate. Yeah, and it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Number five, Dagon and the Deep Ones. Coming up first on our list is a multifaceted entry with Dagon and the Deep Ones who worship him. They kind of go together. What is a Deep One? It's not a sea monster that went to first year philosophy and is always trying to wax poetic, but rather a Deep One refers to a race of amphibious, humanoid-like, ish sea creatures closely resembling creatures like frogs or axolotls. If you've ever seen Hellboy's Abe Sapien or the monster from Shape of Water, those monsters are actually a pretty good representation for what a Deep One should look like. Deep Ones get their name from their homes, deep, deep beneath the sea, obviously, where they live out their cold, often miserable lives. When Deep Ones do venture to the surface, they do so to sweep humans under their influence, promising them riches in exchange for worship, sometimes even mating with them, creating disgusting hybrid Deep Ones. And first and foremost, to ingratiate them into the cult of Dagon, worshipping their master, Dagon, a massive, massive Deep One of fantastic power. Dagon appears in the short story appropriately named Dagon, which is also a great jumping on point. If you've ever been curious about reading H.P. Lovecraft and you didn't know where to start, 
It's one of the first appearances of any of the Lovecraft monsters at all. Dagon is worshipped by humans and deep ones in equal measure, no doubt thanks to his influence. Dagon is immortal, massive, and commands a lot of respect. It's unknown what the full extent of Dagon's power is, but given that he's an immortal sea monster with dominion over a race of pelagic nightmares that do his every bidding, let's assume that if he really wanted to stir up trouble, it would not be that difficult for him. Just ask the town of Innsmouth how they feel about their master. They've got nothing but positive things to say, I'm sure. And hey, while I got you here, if you're liking what we do, we'd always appreciate a subscribe our way, and you'll catch the best horror videos in your inbox every single day. Number four, the Shogoths. A Shogoth or a Shogoth, I'm really not sure, which does sound a bit like something a 1920s chimney sweep might yell at you to get off. Hey, Shogoth is a disgusting, writhing mess of iridescent black slime and a sea of eyeballs engineered by the Elder Things to function as a race of tools for their will, as they're mostly used for undersea construction. They're amorphous, shape-shifting monstrosities, able to mock and reflect all matter of organ and life. A Shoggoth is capable of molding itself however it needs to see fit to accomplish its dark dealings, which make them the perfect tools for the Elder Things. Now, The first generation of Shoggoths were brainless husks, solely driven to appease their masters, but over the eons of their existence, the Shoggoths began to mutate and develop a low form of consciousness, eventually rising up and overthrowing the Elder Things altogether and working for themselves to build their own cities, where they now reside in their city in Antarctica, poorly imitating their old masters, shrieking, Tikali, Tikali, over and over, an old rallying cry the Elder Things would shout at the Shoggoths to get them to work. Poor, poor little amorphous shape-shifting monstrosities. Now, although a Shoggoth was intended to serve mostly as a being for construction, they're not without their abilities. A Shoggoth is hulkingly strong, capable of crushing a human in seconds, and they're known for using their brute strength to solve problems in their way. For example, the Shoggoth that makes an appearance in the Mountains of Madness crushes an entire rookery of penguins that was in its way beneath its mighty weight. While the Shoggoths don't seem to have any higher goals or aspirations, they've shown themselves to be threatening enough that if crossed, you'll regret ever dismissing them as nothing more than tools. Number three, Yugonalak. Yugonalak is colloquially known as the Defiler and is more properly known as the god of depravity and perversion, which is just about the worst way you can introduce yourself on a first date. Yugonalak isn't just into human perversions, oh no, no, no. This wretched Great One has its sights set on something much bigger than anything our little human brains could conjure up. Yugalanak is after depravity on an incomprehensible scale. That's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the Lovecraft mythos, incomprehensible. Yugalanak's true form is unknown, as it seems to exist in a state outside of a physical body. But when it's looking to pursue some of its disgusting pleasures, it always acquires a human host. And when it takes a human host, it warps its body into a wretched, grotesquely obese form, lacking a head or a neck, and featuring a mouth in the palm of both hands. And I cannot imagine that it is getting up to anything good with those palms. Yugawanak is unlike most other great ones in that it's capable of directly speaking to humans in plain old English instead of indecipherable guttural noises. Its ability to speak English and communicate is what helps it to pursue its dark goals as it seeks out humans who read perverse and forbidden literature and it doesn't just hunt Fifty Shades of Grey fans. It plants seeds of interest in human minds to research and eventually manipulating curious enough humans to read from the Revelation of Glocky a cursed book containing Yugalanak's name. When read, it will be summoned. When Yugalanak is summoned, it makes its guests an offer, offering to make the summoner into a priest of Yugalanak, welcoming them into its service. It's best to accept this gracious offer, as a rejection will offend Yugalanak deeply, leading to the summoner to become its next meal. Unfortunate for you, but either way, Yugalanak is very pleased with the outcome. Either it gets a new servant for its life, or it gets a nice little midday snack. Number two, Nyarlotep. Now, Nyarlotep is one of the most sinister entities in all of the Lovecraft pantheon, and one of the most popular beings as well, appearing across several stories in the universe, both by Lovecraft and other authors over the years. Nyarlotep first appears in the short story, Nyarlotep, which is also another great jumping on point for new Lovecraft fans who want to get into the lore somewhere and don't know where to start. It's pretty self-contained. Nyarlotep is unique in the Pantheon for several reasons, but first and foremost is its freedom. Nyarlotep isn't trapped under the sea or in the stars like Cthulhu or Azathoth, but rather enjoys the freedom of the earth as it wanders. It usually likes taking the form of a man, wandering as a tall, joyous, friendly man, 
all the better for it to influence people with. It's said that Nyarlathotep has thousands upon thousands of forms and manifestations, and we can probably safely assume that most of them are horrifying and sanity destroying. Nyarlathotep could actually be described as the most human-like of any of the Elder Gods, which makes it all the more threatening. It's able to sway humans easily, gathering cults of personality around it. The original short story in which it appears, Nyarlathotep is gaining influence over the populations by wandering the world, performing incredible miracles, claiming to have lived for 27 centuries, winning over the hearts and minds of legions of followers willing to devote themselves completely for Nyarlathotep's will. Now, Nyarlathotep seems to take a sickening pleasure in driving humans to madness. For Nyarlathotep, death isn't the end game. But manipulating and twisting humans, driving them to insanity, that's the thrill. I guess it gets pretty boring being an unending, uh, unstoppable power beyond the stars. You gotta find something to keep the day exciting, right? Merely being around Nyarlathotep is enough to make a man sick. Nyarlathotep isn't the absolute most powerful entity in the mythos, but it is definitely one of the most nefarious and threatening. Number one, Yog Sothoth. Oh, it, it doesn't even feel good saying that coming out of the throat. I, I shouldn't be talking about stuff like this. This is this is above my pay grade. Yog Sothoth is a horrifying, unfathomably powerful god, and one of the most powerful gods in the whole mythos. If there's one big takeaway from H.P. Lovecraft's mythos, it's that there's always bigger fish up the food chain. We are so insignificant compared to everything else in the cosmos, but we think ourselves so important. We, the beastly fools of mankind, are dwarfed by the radiant greatness of Cthulhu, but Cthulhu himself is dwarfed by creatures like yogg Sophoth. yogg Sophoth, or Yogi, as his close friends like to call him, is the embodiment of all time and space across the multiverse. yogg Sophoth, like most gods in the Lovecraft pantheon, is an indescribable horror beyond human comprehension, and like Nyarlathotep, is known to be able to manifest and take several avatars to better serve its needs. But its most common form is described as that of being a massive, fractally glowing green orbs that continuously merge, separate, and regrow in an unending, spiraling sea of tentacles, tendrils, and eyes. Yaxothoth sees all. As the manifestation of time and space across the multiverse, there is nothing that can escape its gaze. It's wise to the entirety of all knowledge. It tempts humans by offering to impart that knowledge to those foolish enough to try and take advantage of that offer, who then have their lives utterly destroyed by madness after seeking its favor. The mere sight of Yogg-Sothoth in its natural form is enough to destroy the human brain irreparably. Now Yogg-Sothoth's goals are just utterly beyond our understanding. It can't even be truly said that Yogg-Sothoth is evil in the manner we understand. Our ideas of morality and good and evil just wouldn't register to a being like this. We're just too small to even begin to comprehend the horrors of the multiverse. And it's best we don't, because the more you try to study something like this, the more your obsession grows and the more you seal your own fate. Number five, SCP-1128. Number five on our list, 1128, is a terrifying entity that manifests itself as a colossal aquatic predator. It's sometimes described as a being similar to a shark, only in a more grotesque and twisted appearance, with common descriptions across all sightings being a mouth full of teeth. The entity manifests itself as an aquatic predator to anyone who is given a full description of the beast's appearance, either through a written description or a spoken description, so, Sorry. Sorry for describing it. Few surviving subjects have described it as resembling a massive monstrous deformed shark. Once a subject is exposed to detailed knowledge of 1128, they become infected by its latent psychic ability, forming a connection. From here, no immediate abnormal changes in behavior or occurrences are present, with the only notable variance being a hesitation to enter bodies of water, for good reason, too. Once an exposed subject submerges themselves completely in water, they are caught by 1128. Any submerged water is enough. Subjects are taken mysteriously to an ocean, the location of which is redacted by the Foundation. From here, you are hunted by SCP-1128. The Foundation patrols this unmarked ocean in a desperate attempt to contain the creature and protect anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in its trap. It's difficult to interview subjects after an exposure, as any detailed description of the encounter does run the risk of contaminating more Foundation members. Should a member or subject become infected by SCP-1128, treatment is immediately advised, with Class C amnesiacs being used to try and block memory of the entity. So, maybe for your sake and my sake, try 
try to forget number five entirely for your own safety. Now, the foundation does advise that if you've been enjoying the content that we produce, you should toss a subscribe our way. Number four, SCP-1451. SCP-1451 is an odd one, even by foundation standards. SCP-1451 presents itself as a set of 26 metal statues at the bottom of the ocean. All appear to be statues of children of varying heights. The statues are all standing in a circle, holding each other's hands and facing outwards in a ring formation. Should any object, living or otherwise, with a mass greater than 40 gram, enter into the ring, SCP-1451 begins to animate. The statues will shift themselves in a counterclockwise movement. Their hands will raise and lower slightly, and bubbles can be seen protruding from their mouths. Once it becomes fully animated, SCP-1451 displays advanced strength and tactics, being reported to use various martial arts to dispatch targets, pressure point application on humans, and precise strikes on machinery. They move in perfect unison and coordination, with some speculation that they operate on some level of hive mind mentality across the 26 individual entities. Once SCP-1451 has begun its hunt, it will not rest until it has disposed of whatever invaded its territory. The Foundation refers to three states of SCP-1451. Class 1 is the initial ring of statues in its inert state, Class 2 is the slight animation and bubbling seen present, and a Class 3 situation is when an active hunt has begun. To try and prevent a Class 3 situation, the SCP Foundation has installed a sphere of wire mesh netting to ensure nothing too large enters the ring. Natural water currents and oceanic movement aren't to be obstructed. The creature does need to eat sometimes. Number 3, SCP-835. SCP-835 manifests itself as a large cluster of polyps resembling a species of coral, although it's significantly larger than any discovered species of coral. The center mass of the cluster is a very large oval with 3 meter long polyps at each end. SCP-835 does not move, instead anchoring itself to the ocean floor using heaving tentacles that protrude from the polyps. The tentacles are coated in an adhesive substance and have been shown to be incredibly strong, capable of damaging bulkheads and steel. The coral base of SCP-835 is extremely durable and resistant to most attempts to collect any tissue samples, with the foundation having to use high-powered diamond drill bits to collect even small samples of DNA. SCP-835 emits a large mass of semi-liquid material several times a day from each polyp. The toxic substance appears to be a mixture of digested solids, fecal matters, several bacteria, viruses, and parasites, with many sequences having originated only from 835. So what exactly makes SCP-835 so threatening? Well, sample reports from SCP-835 have shown that it's comprised almost exclusively of human DNA. Its hard shell seems to be recycled tooth enamel, its tentacles matching human flesh. A level 4 clearance declassified document from the Foundation detailed an encounter with an underwater isolation team, in which an incident in which two members of the isolation team were swallowed by SCP-835. Pulled in by its tentacles deep underneath what they had initially thought to be a cave, but realized was the contents of scp 835s stomach. The crew members reported descending deeper and deeper, spending up to 72 hours inside the creature's digestive tract, the insides of its intestines lined with remnants of unfortunate victims, claiming that they had been morphed into flesh and there was a wall of faces crying for release. Eventually, one of the crew members was released, though after significant breaches to its suit, Unfortunately, he had to be let go from the Foundation. We thank him for his service. Number 2, SCP-1092. SCP-1092 presents itself as a class of Astyachthys fish, and when the creature is matured, it resembles any number of other ocean-dwelling fish, with the only notable variance being its increased aggressive behavior, attacking prey. It's difficult for the Foundation to study, as only adult specimens can be studied, as in its juvenile phase, SCP-1092 are parasites birthed from a living host. Once SCP-1092 infects the blood stream of its host, absorbing nutrients directly from the host's blood. Once exposed, the parasites initially are but a few millimeters in most its size, but grow many times their size, with the largest extracted one on record being 2.1 centimeters. There is insufficient data on how SCP-1092 infects its hosts. The current research data theorizes that minuscule eggs makes its way into the body through small cuts and scrapes, which would explain the fish's violent tendencies. Those infected by SCP-1092 report fatigue, weight loss, and increased appetite and in many cases report a feeling of something fluttering or squirming inside the body. However, this is not present in all cases, as there are reported case files of hosts not experiencing any visible symptoms whatsoever until the parasite has unfortunately matured to its adult aquatic stage. Once the parasites have matured, the now adolescent creature will try to forcibly remove themselves from the physical body of their host, using their sharp teeth to cut through blood vessels and skin. Subjects at this stage will sustain injuries, severe blood loss, and in some cases worse. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation has effectively secured SCP-1092, keeping it housed in a completely watertight cell, where it is given the occasional domestic pig to act as a host for its reproductive cycle. Poor little piggy. Thank you.
Piggy. Thank you, Foundation. Number one, SCP-3000. SCP-3000 is one of the most powerful SCPs currently being monitored by the Foundation. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity and is a Level 5 classified document. I really shouldn't even be talking to you about this, but it's good to get this information out there. It is a massive, massive aquatic sea serpent that closely resembles a moray eel, only gigantic. There's been significant difficulty in efforts in trying to document its true size, but it is estimated to be anywhere between between 600 and 900 kilometers in length, with its head measuring roughly 2.5 meters wide and its body as large as 10 meters in diameter. SCP-3000, thankfully, is typically a sedentary creature, not moving much at all, usually only responding to feeding. The majority of its body rarely moves. SCP-3000 has been known to be carnivorous, and when it hunts, it has been known to move exceedingly quickly. Fascinatingly, despite its gargantuan size, SCP-3000 does not appear to need sustenance to maintain its body's function, and thus its digestive process is unknown. Although complicating matters slightly is a process wherein SCP-3000 disperses a thin layer of viscous dark gray sludge through its skin whilst it consumes its prey. It doesn't stop there though. SCP-3000 has been recognized to cause severe mental damage in those who research it. Direct observation and study has been proven to cause mental alteration in Foundation researchers, experiencing paranoia, fear, anxiety, memory loss, and most worryingly, inexplicable severe headaches. It's unknown how SCP-3000 causes this, but the theories are that it has a latent psychic ability. There are some who believe SCP-3000 could be an old god that has found its way into our world. The creature is too immense to be contained in any Foundation facility, instead being kept in a clandestine area of the Bay of Bengal, in an area barred from the public, routinely patrolled and surrounded by Foundation vessels. Be extremely thankful that the brave members of the Foundation are researching and containing this. Secure, contain, protect. Those are the goals of the Foundation. Number five on this list is the whale fish. This fish is like a legendary Pokemon when it comes to how rare it is. Live Science says, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute released footage in August showing a bright orange female whalefish around 6,600 feet deep offshore of Monterey Bay, California. Very little is known about this bizarre fish because of the three drastically different appearances of the juveniles, which are called tape tails, males, which are called big nose fish, and females, which are called whale fish. The three forms look so different that scientists originally thought that they were three different species. This shape-shifting transformation from juvenile to mature females is believed to be one of the most extreme among vertebrates. Whalefish have rarely been seen alive in the deep, so many mysteries remain regarding these remarkable fish. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute tweeted, Let's pull up this image from the Smithsonian that really shows off exactly how weird this fish is. So here we have the three fish, and you can see exactly how different they all are. The Smithsonian says there are other examples of males and females with very different shapes and of animals changing from one shape to another as they grow older. But this is one of the most amazing examples of sexual dimorphism combined with metamorphosis ever found among vertebrates. So we are talking literally about a super rare shape-shifting fish that in my opinion looks creepy as all holy hell. I'd say that you can find this beast at the bottom of the ocean but odds are you won't ever even run into it because of how rare it is. We've been exploring the bottom of our oceans for quite some time now and we are only just starting to learn a little bit about this fish. In all honesty, we really have no idea about it though. Whatever it is or whatever it does, one thing is pretty clear to me though. It's creepy looking, it lives at the bottom of the ocean, and I don't like it. Number four on this list is the goblin shark. This fish has got to be at the top of everyone's lists when it comes to the grossest looking creatures in the world. National Geographic says, swishing through the deep sea, a goblin shark notices a small, yummy looking squid. The animal inches towards its prey, but as the fish closes in, the snack starts to dart away. So the shark thrusts its jaw three inches out of its mouth. The jaw is connected to three inch long flaps of skin that can unfold from its snout. The predator then grabs the squid in its teeth. 
After scarfing down the meal, the shark fits its jaw back into its mouth and swims off. That's right guys, a goblin shark's top and bottom teeth are attached to ligaments or bands of skin tissue tucked into its mouth. When prey is just out of reach, the shark extends the elastic tissue out of the mouth to nab the grub. This allows the animal to chow down on snacks such as teleost fish and squid. It also makes the shark one jaw-dropping fish. These disgusting looking creatures like to live right at the bottom of the ocean and are native to the oceans around Japan. There are also some of them off of South Africa and in the ocean water surrounding Portugal. They can grow to be 12 feet long and weigh almost 500 pounds. These aren't monsters, but they may as well be. A 500 pound beast with a detachable jaw that looks like a goblin just chilling at the deepest darkest part of the ocean. I truly cannot think of a whole lot of creatures I would rather run into than this freaking thing. Number three on this list is the proboscis worm. I don't care what anyone says, this has to be a monster. Just based on literally how freaking gross it is, it needs to be qualified as a monster. This species is also known as ribbon worms, and there are actually a ton of ribbon worms in the world. The ones I'm talking about reside deep at the bottom of the ocean. These ones usually grow to be bigger than the other ones in the world. The Smithsonian Magazine says the largest species of ribbon worm is the bootlace worm, which can be found writhing among rocks in the waters of the North Sea. Not only is it the largest Nemertian, but it may also be the longest animal on the planet. Uncertainty remains because these stretchy worms are difficult to accurately measure, but they have been found at lengths of over 30 meters and are believed to even grow as long as 60 meters longer than the blue whale. Despite their length, they are less than an inch around. Now these creatures don't have any natural predators and let me tell you why. Because they look disgusting. Like, let me ask you guys, would you want to eat that? I would straight up need to be starving and there would literally need to be nothing edible left on the planet other than this thing before I decide to take a bite. It literally looks like a large intestine that just slithers across the bottom of the ocean. Shockingly enough, this is a real thing though and you can find it chilling in deep waters. Number two on this list is zombie worms. We aren't quite done with the worm talk yet guys because now we have got to look at zombie worms. Zombies are a pretty terrifying monster, so are these just like them? The Smithsonian says zombie worms don't crave brains, instead they seek bones. The 1 to 3 inch Ostax worms were first discovered in the bones of a rotting grey whale on the deep sea floor nearly 10,000 feet deep in 2002. Since then, more Osidex species have been discovered. There are 26 according to the World Register of Marine Species. Zombie worms don't eat mineral bones directly, instead they digest fats within the bone. However, their style of eating is quite different from ours because they don't have a mouth or a stomach. They secrete an acid from their skin that dissolves bone, freeing up the fat and protein trapped inside. Then, symbiotic bacteria living in the worm's body digests the fat and protein. How Osidax acquire nutrients from the bacteria isn't known. They may simply digest the bacteria or nutrients are somehow transferred to the worm. They hold on to whatever bones they can find by drilling in with roots which contain the symbiotic bacteria. Zombie worms can retract these plumes into the body when they are disturbed. If all this isn't strange enough, the only worms doing any drilling are female. The microscopic males live inside their bodies. One study counted 111 males inside just one female zombie worm. This eliminates the pesky step of having to search for a mate because the eggs and sperm are right next to each other. Then the worms can disperse many fertilized eggs far and wide, hoping that they land near some recently fallen bones. Needless to say, but these are some weird freaking creatures. No wonder we've nicknamed them zombie worms. They're about as monstrous as you could possibly get. Not to mention, but they feast on the bodies and bones of the dead, similarly to what zombies would want to be doing. Number one on this list is the Sloan's Viperfish. 
As with most things on this list, we have a thoroughly disgusting looking creature. This thing is just as dangerous as it is disgusting though. The Twilight Zone says, like many of the inhabitants of the deep sea, Sloan's viperfish sport light producing organs called photophores along its body. These flashing blue, green, or yellow lights might attract tasty snacks, but they're most useful for masking the fish's silhouette from predators below. They're also useful for grabbing a meal. When prey comes near, the viper fish drops a glowing light on its dorsal fin ray like a fishing lure in front of its mouth and snap. A muscular jaw filled with clear, sharp teeth comes crashing down like a guillotine. Lucky for the viper fish, its first vertebrae has evolved to act as a shock absorber for that powerful bite. This is the deep sea version of a piranha, except way more deadly. If you were getting attacked by piranhas, there would likely need to be multiple of them to attack you to actually win. I could totally see a world though where you lose one on one versus this thing though. Its teeth would literally dig so deep in your body. Even at the thickest part of your body, this thing has the potential to go all the way through if it bites you well enough. Thank goodness it's swimming thousands of meters below us and we don't need to worry about it popping up on our next snorkeling adventure. Number five, SCP-169. SCP-169 is a massive, sentient, and highly aggressive creature that sort of resembles an arthropod with multiple appendages. It has the ability to regenerate any damage inflicted on its body, making it virtually indestructible. Now its size and strength make it a formidable foe, and its potential for destruction is immeasurable. This entity is incomprehensibly large. We're actually having quite a bit of difficulty measuring it. It spans anywhere from 2,000 to 8,000 thousand meters wide. As such, the nickname Leviathan is sometimes used by less than professional researchers discussing the creature in a comic vein. The entity was first discovered in the early 1900s and has been under close observation and confinement ever since. It is speculated to have originated from the pre-Cambrian era. It's currently housed in a secure facility with multiple layers of containment measures in place to prevent any breaches. Of course, only authorized personnel with the highest clearance level are allowed access to the facility and the entity itself, and normally all this would be very classified information, but a brief press release has allowed me to share it with you today. SCP-169 is classified as a Euclid level threat, meaning that it requires constant monitoring and attention to prevent any potential threats it may pose. Any attempts to breach containment will be met with the full force of the law, and those responsible will be held accountable for any damages or loss of life that may occur. Now these containment protocols include things like regular monitoring of behavior, physical health, as well as specialized equipment to help keep it sedated and under control. Now while the Megalodon at one point in time could have been considered the king of the waters for its era, it's indisputable that in any physical confrontation, SCP-169 would pose a much greater threat. And my viewers, if you're interested in more SCP content, we've actually had several joint operations between Top 5 Scary and the SCP Foundation, and there's lots of ground to cover. But if you're interested in topics other than our beloved foundation, Top 5 Scary has a lot of that as well. So please, we encourage you to subscribe, even hitting the bell to be notified of future video uploads. But we would humbly request that you do that after this video is completed, as there are more interesting SCPs to listen to. Number 4. SCP-682. This might very well be one of the most renowned items in storage in the Foundation. It's very well known. It's a Euclid class object manifesting as a massive reptilian creature, measuring approximately 18 meters in length and standing approximately 6 meters tall at the shoulder. Now SCP has a very tough scaly hide that at time of writing appears to be impervious to almost all forms of physical damage. As such, the containment unit that we store SCP-682 in is perpetually filled with hydrochloric acid in an attempt to slow the entity's regenerative abilities. SCP-682 has shown to be hostile to an unparalleled degree, displaying what we refer to as a profound hatred for all biological life. It's extremely aggressive and displays advanced intelligence with its intelligence believed to be comparable to a well-educated human if not greater and has shown incredible ability to adapt to new situations. It's capable of adjusting its body mass to serve its needs as it consumes and sheds matter. Its regenerative abilities are shown to shrug off and sustain injuries that would otherwise flatline most forms of biological life, making containment rather difficult during the few occasions of breaches that have occurred. Now, containment of SCP-682 is a top priority for the Foundation, as it poses an extreme threat 
to both personnel and the public of course as well. Its containment chamber is located in a specially designed underground facility which is very heavily fortified and equipped with the latest in containment technology. Some I would love to share with you but unfortunately I'm not at liberty to do so. The chamber is monitored round the clock by a team of trained personnel who are equipped with the latest in weapons and protective gear. But things happen and in the event of a breach all personnel are to evacuate the facility immediately and we initiate what is called a level 4 lockdown. All available resources are then deployed to recontain the SCP including our mobile task forces and in some cases air support and heavy artillery. We have also been authorized in some events to use nuclear weapons in case all other measures fail. This is suffice to say a series of reasons why SCP-682 poses what we would consider a grand threat to a creature like the Megalodon, which it would probably consider insignificant. Number 3, SCP-3000. SCP-3000 is one of the more infamous entities being kept in the Foundation. It's a Keter class object and represents a dangerous and enigmatic entity threatening the safety of the world at large. This creature manifests as a behemoth sized sea serpent like creature that resides in the depths of the Pacific Ocean. Its immense size, strength and its unknown potential for cataclysmic damage and destruction make it a chief cause of concern for the Foundation and thusly its containment is one of the utmost important to Foundation members. Now this entity's exact origin and purpose do remain unknown at time of writing but current speculation is that this creature is possibly millions of years old and possesses an intelligence far greater in scope than initially observed vastly surpassing passing average human intelligences. Now because of the nature of SCP-3000, containment protocols for this creature do prove to be a bit of a challenge, requiring perpetual monitoring and undivided attention. The area surrounding SCP-3000, currently a region of the <laughs> Sorry, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Roughly 300 kilometers wide is routinely patrolled by Foundation vessels. The area is sequestered from all civilian attempting any form of exploration or diving effort. Any individual we reasonably believe has been contacted or affected by SCP-3000 are to be contained at Site 151. Should we have reason to believe that these individuals have been affected by the more anomalous properties of SCP-3000, this quarantine of the individuals will be indefinite. But rest assured proper care will be taken. SCP-3000 is recorded as a class 8 cognitive hazardous entity as a direct observation of SCP-3000 has been shown to cause serious mental alterations in subjects. We've experienced individuals who directly observing SCP-3000 develop inexplicable head pains, paranoia, extreme anxiety, memory loss, and even alteration. There are unsettling traces of evidence to suggest that SCP-3000 is even capable of manipulating the thoughts and desires of subjects who come into contact with it. So <laughs> why don't you let us handle it? Nope. Number 2, SCP-1128. SCP-1128 is a Euclid class object and a particularly unusual one, even by Foundation standards. It's an immense aquatic threat that appears to those who are known of it. The creature is believed to reside in the depths of the ocean and little is known about its origin or behavior. It was first brought to our attention when a fishing vessel reported an encounter with a strange and terrifying creature in the waters off the coast of, well I can't say. The fisherman described a large dark shape that appeared to be swimming towards them at an incredible speed. The creature had glowing eyes and sharp teeth and appeared to be intent on attacking the vessel. Now further investigation would reveal that SCP-1128 is an entity that manifests as a massive aquatic predator, similar to a megalodon actually. We suspect that some megalodon sightings might be SCP-1128 sightings. Now anyone given a full description of this thing's appearance through either spoken or written descriptions or visual descriptions of the being will cause it to appear to you. As such we will try to keep it very for you. I wouldn't worry too much, Dr. Bright has reassured me that no threat present should be in this video. Persons infected by SCP-1128's will exhibit no outwardly bizarre behavior, with the exception of an aversion to activities involving water, such as bathing or swimming. Now fascinatingly, should the subject become fully immersed, the subject will disappear regardless of death. The subject will then reappear in a vast ocean-like space, a liminal space, where they are pursued by SCP-1128. We have recovered individuals like this before, and interviews with these individuals do carry some risk of infection spreading, as descriptions of the entity do trigger further infection. As such, Foundation members involved in any study and containment of SCP-1128 are provided Class C amnesiacs to cloud their memory of the anomalous properties. So maybe try and forget that last point, just for your own safety. 
SCP-3008. For our final entry today, I've brought an SCP that most of our researchers do agree to be somewhat humorous. We understand some levity is welcome when discussing unusual topics such as these. SCP-3008 is a Euclid-class object unusually manifesting as an IKEA retail flagship store that seemingly expands fractally ever onwards, with an indefinite undefined end. It is populated by a series of unknown, vaguely humanoid entities, sometimes referred to colloquially as the staff, and internally in our documents as SCP-3008-2. Our current data suggests that the IKEA should be 10 kilometers squared, which is already preposterously large, but laser range finding has led us to reasonably believe the space is infinite. Within SCP-3008, there are an unknown number of civilians who have found themselves trapped within the space. Our studies have revealed to us that fascinatingly, they formed a rudimentary society, with the seat of their government being the recliners department. SCP-3008-2 that I mentioned earlier, the staff, superficially resemble humans, but with exaggerated or incorrect body proportions. They possess no discernible facial features, but are observed they are wearing a yellow shirt and blue trousers consistent with IKEA uniforms. Interestingly, the IKEA store, SCP-3008, appears to have its own independent day and night cycle. During the day, the store exists fairly normally like an IKEA you might visit. But during the night, the humanoids of SCP-3008-2 will become increasingly violent to the human survivors. Now, we have observed observed more than one exit of the place, meaning containment within is not permanent. However, trouble for us, these exits seem to fluctuate, making escape treacherously random. Since our studies began, 14 individuals have managed to leave, and a few of them have even managed to recuperate and rejoin society, with middling effects. We believe that would the Megalodon be transported to SCP-3008, it would find itself rather overwhelmed with the lack of water, and therefore would not possess a significant threat. <laughs>